BBC Houston. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. We welcome you. If you're tuning in online, we welcome you this morning. Would you rise to your feet as we give God a shout of praise? No shame, no fear. No shame. All of 
Father, this morning, God, we lift up our life to you. Father, we lift up our families to you, God. We lift up the relationships in our lives. God, we lift up our finances, our health, everything in our world, God, we give to you knowing that you are the king who sits on the throne. So, Father, we declare this anthem over our church, our family. God, everything in this world, Father, everything that we love, God, we put it in your hands this morning. Church, let's sing that in my life. declaration, God. God, that everything that is within us, Lord, that we would give a shout of praise to you, that we would give you glory, Father, and that we would lift your name on high. God, for your name is the one that breaks chains. Your name is the one that gives us freedom and victory, God. And we believe it this morning, Lord, that as we call upon you, that you would meet us right here, right now, God, that we would be fulfilled in your presence, Lord. We thank you for this morning, God, that we get to gather, Lord, as a church to say, you are God, you are King, Father. We lift your name on high, we give you praise. We give a shout of praise to you this morning, Father. We lift your name on high, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, church. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. Amen, amen, amen. It is such a joy to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and what a great way to start this Sunday, to just come up here with everyone and just gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and for those watching online, to just lift up the name of Jesus, because it is Jesus is the reason why we are here. It's Jesus is the reason why we worship God, because He restored our relationship with Him, and let's continue to give Him our everything, because Jesus gave us His everything on that cross some 2,000 years ago. And so at this time, we want to continue to lift the name of Jesus, continue to worship Him through our tithing and offering, and what a privilege it is to just worship God through our giving, because He, you know, has blessed us so much financially, and even though you might think you have a little, that's still a lot more than what many people across the world have, and so in that, let's continue to trust God in our finances, because I know that many of us are believing for more, but if we just are faithful in what God has given us now. It says in Malachi that we can test Him, and God will open up His floodgates in heaven to bless us beyond measure, be beyond more than what we can handle. And so those who are here, those who are online, if you have your offering out, let's lift this time up and pray over it. God, we love you so much. 
that you love us unconditionally. There is no greater love that we could ever receive than from you, our Father. And we thank you, Lord God, for giving your Son, Jesus. You gave us your absolute best to redeem us, to restore us, to give us victory, God, over our sin. And so, God, this morning, we just want to give back and worship, God, uh, you in our giving and our offering, God. We just say we love you, God. We thank you, God. We rejoice in your goodness. We rejoice, God, in your loving kindness, God, and your mercies for us, God, that are made new every morning. God, we are nothing without you, God. Our lives are incomplete without you, God. You fulfill us, God. You give us a destiny and a purpose, God, and we just lift up the tithing and offering. We ask, God, that you will bless it. God, may you use it, God, to expand your kingdom, God. Lord, will you use this offering, God, to reach those out there who have yet to know Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you, God, that you are working so mightily, God, in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community, around the nation. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the offering team comes up to collect the offering, we just have one announcement this morning. Revival Conference 2019 is coming up real soon. It's only four months away. This year, once again, it will be at VBC Houston here at our church from Thursday, October 10th to Sunday, uh, October 13th. Registration is open right now, and if you visit uh, revivalconference.org, you can find information about um, just booking hotel rooms and registering. Early registration is taking place right now until August the 11th, and early registration is $50. After August 11th, it's $65. So please pass the word. We are believing and praying that God will just do mighty things and for people to be touched and you know leave the conference to go back into their workplaces, families, churches if they come from out of town and just be on fire for the Lord and just you know continue to do all that God has called us to do and being you know uh, being able to go into our communities and our co uh, workplaces to change lives in the name of Jesus and so with that those are our announcements and if everyone could just give a warm welcome to our senior pastor this morning who's back from uh, the Holy Land of Israel I saw great pictures uh, of just all that God was doing over there. And it's always great to have our senior pastor back. And so if you could just stand up and give him a warm welcome. Let's welcome back Pastor Khan. Thank you, church. Well, before I share the message today, I want to invite you to do something that is very important. Uh, this Thursday, we will celebrate July 4, the freedom that God has give to this country and uh, the right to have life is uh, very important for us and this country as I travel the world I say that it's very important the rest of the world watching uh, America watching the church in America because we set tone for a lot of things in this world and as we prepare to celebrate this um, Thursday, uh, the July 4, the independent of the United States of America, we um, want to pause and, and I invite you to drop on your knees and pray for this country. We have so much things going on, so much things at stake. And we know that we need God. We need, America needs to return to God. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our country, and we pray for the church in America that God will uh, continue to pour out His uh, presence, His power, and restore the church to its rightful place and use the church in America to be a blessing to the rest of the world. Would you join me as we lift up this country, our country, uh, before God? <clears throat> Lord, we're grateful to be here in this free land, America. We're grateful for you has established this country, one of the only two countries established on the foundation of the, on the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for everything that we have enjoyed, 
everything that we have here in this country. And we ask that you will continue to lead us and guide us, Lord, that this freedom continue to be a powerful experience that we have in life and share this freedom to the rest of the world. Father, we thank you for our leaders and we continue to pray that you will guide them and lead them, Lord. The decision that they make is to empower, is to be leading, guiding by your Spirit. And Father, we live this country before you. Forgive us for the wrong thing that we have pursued. We ask that you will bless this country. Again, Lord, lie a city on the hill, nothing can hidden. We pray that you will, Lord, help us as a church, that we will be salt and light in this world, in this country. And we will function as a heart of America. But what America will be if the heart is sick, we ask that you will heal your church, restore your church, revive your church, Lord. That we once again to be a country that you will use us to finance the preaching of the gospel and share your good news to the rest of the world. And your kingdom will come and your will be done. That many people, Lord, will be saved. According to your world, Lord, there will be the greatest revival in the end time. And we know that, with that at that very end, we ask that you will pour out your grace, your power, your anointing on your church, Lord, that she can be the blessing to mankind. We thank you, Lord. We pray as we celebrate July 4 this week, as we enjoy the freedom that we have here, that you will keep our heart, our life, free from sin, so your power can work through us, Lord, and cause us to be a blessing to thousands upon thousands of people. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Very important for us to pray for our country at this time. There's so much going on. I don't have to say much, but you know. And so we need to keep our leader in prayer and ask the Lord to lead them and guide them. We praise God for the freedom that we have. I just, as Min said, that return from Holy Land. And as I travel, I see things that is, is, um, is much different than what we enjoy here. There is so much freedom, there is so much uh, safety that we have here in this country. But it's threatened as we need to uh, protect the freedom that we have. And we need to be mindful of what's going on and ask the Lord to give us back the saltiness that we're supposed to have uh, so we can impact the society, the people around us and bring many into the kingdom. Well, we in a message series right now. The pastor Sam have shared with us and start this series. Uh, we titled the, the series, Things That Jesus Never Said. You may ask why would the church talking about things that Jesus never said? Because many people go to church hearing things. A couple of what people say. And they put in Jesus smiles a word that he never said. And so when you have a wrong premise, you go about, do wrong thing, and you not even know. 
There's many things that we say, and we say, well, that is in the Bible. Uh, for example, um, we, we, we say things like, uh, the truth will set you free. Actually, that is not true. The truth that you know will set you free, not the truth set you free. Thing that we say without knowing the full effect of it. Another saying that we say like, um, uh, love of money. Money is the root of all evil. No, the word of God say the love of the money is the root of evil. So there's a lot of things that people go around and throw things around, and uh, unfortunately, many people use us to guide their life. And we here, as uh, leaders, we prayed and thinking about what we need to study to make an impact in this world. We come to the decision that one of the things that we need to do is to correct what people believe. Because what you believe will lead to your life, how you live. And it's important that we have correct belief. That's why we need to learn the thing that Jesus never said in order for us to see a powerful thing uh, of what he actually said. The purpose of this series is to find the true power of what Jesus said. There's many uh, things that is at stake when we uh, believe the wrong thing and we practice what Jesus does not tell us to practice. And today we're going to talk about what he did not say about happiness. What I know about most, if not all of you, is you want happiness in life. But the problem is, do you know what brings true happiness in life? I want to advise you this morning to look at what Jesus didn't say about happiness and to find the power of what he did say. Let me give you a few things that is, um, people are uh, talking about that is not what Jesus really said. He did not say, go out to the world and preach what people, what make people happy. He did not tell us to go out there and just share the message that um, make sure that people were not upset with us. He did not say that we, when we preach the gospel, make sure that we not offend anybody. And here is another thing that Jesus never said is, ask and his will given to you because God will spoil you. He is a, the grandfather that willing to spend money on anything that we want. It's not all that. You know, God never said about happiness in that way. Today I want to uh, look together in the Gospel of John chapter 8. There's a story that's important for us to, to look at. And importantly, at the end of this story, we'll look at exactly what Jesus did not say to make sure that we understand what Jesus did say so we can build our life on the foundation of the truth from the Word of God. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 2 to 6. It says, Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them, then the scribe and the Pharisee brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, 
testing him that they may have something of which to accuse him. Now let's pause here and we, we, we will continue on with the story. But let, let's think about it. That if this woman is were caught red-handed in adultery, then have to have a man in this story. If they caught this woman in the act of adultery, then where is the man? Why they drag only the woman, this poor woman, and, and put in their midst? Probably that man is one of them. How come only her? Because it's easier to be picked on. The reason they brought her to Jesus is not to, um, to, to do something about the adultery. But the scripture tells us here that this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. So they want to set a trap so they can accuse Jesus because things is very complicated here the way that they set it up according to the law of Moses she guilty can be stoned to death and if Jesus agree he will lose the reputation of a loving teacher, a loving rabbi. But if he say, let her go, then he condone adultery. So it's very difficult. They thought that they set it up and for sure Jesus would stumble in either opinion. But verse 6, part B said, but Jesus stood down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. The question that many of us have when we come to this story, what is he right on the saying? And for me, that's one of the questions that I will ask Jesus when I see him. Lord, on that day, what you really write down on the same. What did he write? The later manuscript um, tell us that um, he brought the sin of the accuser. There's a word in Greek called graphene, meant to write it down. And kata graphene, kata mean against. So possibly that Jesus write out the sin that against the leaders, the Pharisee, and the people stand there. I can imagine he, with the word of knowledge, write out the sin of the ringleader that brought this woman before him. Something that nobody knows, only God knows. Verse 7 says, So when they continued to ask him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Note that the word without sin among you. Without sin, it also mean without even wanting to sin. If you're so righteous, you're so holy, cast the first stone. So you see, it is easy to see sin in other people, and we overlook our own. We're very generous with our sin. But we pick on the sin of other people. And we want to bring judgment on them. Verse 8 to 11, 
It said, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he asked her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Had no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Note that he did not say, Go and do whatever makes you happy. Go and continue to do what you've been doing. It doesn't matter. Just go. Continue to do what makes you happy. No, it's not. But it says, go now. Like, urgently, go right now. Live the life of sin. Sin no more. Go and change your life. Go and be free. That's what he did. That's what Jesus said. And it's so powerful. Yes, he not condemned her because he come to be the redemption. He would pay for the sin for the whole world, for mankind. His love is so great that it doesn't matter what you do that will make him love you less. He loves us. And they want us to live free. But we only enjoy the freedom and the blessing of God when we walk in freedom. Let me draw some, some lesson that we can see here that is applicable to our everyday life. Why do we give in to temptation to sin? Many times because it's so fun. It's look good. Because sin have the enjoyment for the moment. But in the end, it will sting you, it will destroy you. But first, when you look at temptation, you say, wow. When you step in, it's hurt you, and you say, uh-oh. I mess up. Why do we give in to the temptation of sin? Because it looks good, but it's just a commercial. When sin and temptation are able to lure you in, and the thing inside of you, your sinful nature, you reach out to grab the temptation and you begin to conceive and you act on it. Then the book of James say, it's come death. Sin promised satisfaction. But at the cost of disobedience to God, none of us will go out there and say, let's mess up our life. But we, we, we hear the commercial, we saw a thing that sin promised us. It's promised satisfaction. But wait a minute, it's, it's, the cost is to disobedient God. We don't know how she get into this place. This woman. Now let's imagine compromise is one slide at a time. Say, this woman in our today home, she have a husband because adultery it's not, it's different with fornication. Adultery is, is mean that this woman is married. And she can make, make, uh, commit a, a sin of sexual sin with another man, but not her husband. The thing is, may start at home. 
she may have a husband inattentive. They live in different worlds together. He may take her for granted. Woman, cook me a meal, do this and do that without values her. He can be verbally abuse her. The thing is not good at home. As I stick in marriage and Richmond, I'm talking about love unit that every one of us have an account and people around us, every time they do something that meet our emotional need, they deposit some love unit in there. Just imagine the, the imaginable numbers like a thousand units. And when it's rich to that point, you fall in love with that person. But every time that you do something annoying, you withdraw. And so you can vision this, this woman here, maybe her husband take a lot of withdrawal. Right now in her bank account for her husband is empty. But then at work, there's a nice guy at work. Pay attention to her, compliment her work, like her idea, notice her hair and say, what a, a haircut you have. At first, she takes it, oh, just something innocent. Nothing wrong. But this man is continue to comment on her Instagram post. Every time she have a new status, he jump right in and say something nice. Slowly, she finds herself thinking about him a lot more and looking forward to see him at office. Cannot wait to get out of the house because her husband at home keep do a lot of withdrawal. While this man is not her husband, deposit a lot of love units into her account. Her heart begins to shift. The man try more reason to stay late at work. And one day open up, talk to her about his marriage, how he struggled at home. And as he shared his feeling, they begin to have a deeper level of connecting. He say things like, I think I make a mistake when I marry my wife. I wish I marry somebody like you. That's a red flag. So men and women who are married, listen to this message, set up a lot of alarm system. When you begin to share your feeling with somebody that is not your wife, man, you notice your heart is shifting. Woman, when you begin to confide with a man that is not your husband about what you're feeling, you know that you're in danger. And they slowly feel very useful around each other. At home, it's just like life is boring, life is, is suffer. But at work or around this particular person, they feel very useful. Eventually, she realized that her emotion is out of control. But she wondered how can this be wrong while it feels so good? It feels so right. And that's the trick of the devil. Temptation and sin is when you, when, when you know that it's wrong. But you're feeling. You say, how can this be wrong when 
I feel so right right now. She thought to herself, "He's the one that missing in my marriage, in my life. He make me happy. We have just become best friend. We we'll talk to each other. We enjoy each other company, step by step. Then she find herself half naked, stand in front of, in the midst of, this leader." And Jesus stand there at the lowest part of her life. You see, that's how sin work in our life. Temptation come, we compromise a little bit at a time, just a little bit. Nothing harmless, just innocent. It's just a conversation that we say and and let go, flirting a little bit. The danger is when you get to a certain spot and you stop. Next time, you not start from the beginning; you start from there, and then keep build up, build up to the point that you get to the place that you not even recognize who you are. In today culture, we approach life with. Relativistic belief. We say there is no absolute truth. It's relative. What is true for you is may not true for me. That's what people say. So do what make you happy. And we will see that the media, movie, talk show. They do all of this around us. They want to condition us to think like they want us to think. Do what makes you happy. It doesn't matter what the church say, whatever ever Pastor Khan says. It doesn't matter what the Bible say. Do what makes you happy, because ultimately, that's your life. You see how dangerous it is. So, without a belief in absolute truth, truth is defined by whatever make me happy. Better way is we need to go back to the Word of God, absolute truth, and the Word of God will lead you to build your life on the strong foundation. Last week, as I walk around Jerusalem and Holy Land, the minister of foreign affairs of Israel has set up a tour for us. If we go to this location on this mountain, and they share with us stories and 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 things that we able to connect to what. In the Bible that I have been reading uh, most of my life, now I'm see is I'm standing right there. They take us to this mountain top. It's believed that at that spot, when Abraham and his nephew Lot、um, have to depart because their cattle their、um, is is grow so big they cannot go together anymore. And Lot took the the good portion that he think he looked into the distant city and saw Sodom and Gomorrah, and they、um, he he took that portion. Abraham by faith lifted up his eye, and God said, "Look to your left, to your right, north and south, east and west. However, wherever your eyes can see, how far your eye can see, I give you the land." And there's something inside of me to just live for joy when I'm say, "Wow, I'm standing at the place that Abraham, standing there and look out through the valleys and everything, and it's dawn on me, the Bible that I've been learn, 
restudying. It's true. The only book in, in our religion, the Bible of our Christian faith, is built on something that you can verify location, geographic, history. And when you're in Israel, you can walk in the land among the people who know their root. You can see things, landmark that they tell you that this is, is an amazing book. But not only just geographic history values, but it's the truth that is written in this book. You can build your life and know that you will be very happy. True happiness is come from when you study and apply the Word of God in your life because it's the strongest foundation that you can build your life on. Important for us to remember that. Because when the bottom line of my happiness is my happiness, is happiness become the standard for which I judge my action. But we need to base our life on the Word of God. Because our feeling will betray us. Knowing is wrong, but feels so right. Our feeling many times is betray us. But the Word of God will correct and help you. The problem is so many things, happiness and holiness are at odds. to one another. If you choose happiness, then you destined for miserable existence. A nerve. A geek. You dress funny. You hold that book and you go to the church, listen to people talk, that induce your worship. When you go home, you cannot do this and you not do that. And so people feel that if you choose to live a holy life, then you don't have happiness in your life. Actually, the opposite is true. When you live a holy life according to the Word of God, with the power of God, is bring true happiness. People think about God and say, if you're talking about heaven, God is not heaven. Because God said that he loves his children and not let them be happy. But can I share with you, I approach 60 in my life, live long enough, to let you know that as the most happiness people, happy people in this world are those who live according to the Word of God and walk this life in freedom. They may look awkward, backward to you, but their life is so solid. When the storm of life comes, only those who build their life in the Word of God and apply the Word of God can stand. Just like Jesus said, those who hear His Word and apply it, obey it. Just like a wise man built his house on the rock. When the rain comes, the wind blow, that's how it stand. But those who study the Word of God and not apply it and ignore it, it's like the foolish man built his house on sand. When the wind blow, when the rain come, that's how it's collapsed because it's not built on the solid foundation, but it's built on sand. Important for us to remember that. So God is a real loving Father. Matthew 7, 11 said, If you then, being evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? You see, Jesus helped us here to do comparison. If we, as a father of children, I, I know exactly what Jesus is talking about here. But Jesus compared and say, if you then being evil, there's flaw, there's thing in, in parent. But they know how to give good gifts to their children. I never see a parent who would say, oh, you don't know how to enjoy this beef steak. Let me eat it for you. Let's go out there and eat some sand and rock. No, they want to give their children the best gift that they can give. And then Jesus compared and say, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Do you see here that the lifestyle that God the Father wants us to live is the best ever? And He wants us to enjoy it. He wants us to walk in the way that He set for us so we can have true happiness in life. The problem is we're looking in the wrong place. Let me walk you through this wonderful thing that I learned and discovered and it's totally changed my life. In the beginning, when God created heaven and earth, the scripture tells us in, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 11, then God said, let the earth or the soil bring forth grass, the earth, that you see, and the fruit tree that you fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth and is worth so. Note it with me. When God wants to create the plant, the tree, the earth, what God speak to? It said here, then God said, let the earth, he speak to the earth, to he speak to the soil. Why? Because it's the environment for the tree and the plant to be in, to habitat. So when God wants to create something, he speak to his source. And then in verse 20, then God said, let the water bow with an abundance of living creature and let the bird fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of heaven. When God wants to create fish and, and living thing in the water, what God speaks to? He speaks to the water. Let the water abound with abundance of living things. Why? Because water is the environment for fish to live in. When you take the fish out of water, what's going on to the fish? It's out of its environment. It's where die eventually. That's why every time we go to um, piers and see people stand there and fishing, and you look into the bucket and you see there's a fish in there, the first question pop out in your mind is, is it still alive? Why? Because you're expecting fish that take out of the ocean or take out of the river or the lake. It will die soon. Why? Because you take it out of its environment. Nobody stand on the shoreline and look and see fish swimming and say, are you still alive? No, they're alive because they're in their environment. And then verse 24, then God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind 
and his beast soul. So when God wants to create an animal, what does God speak to? He speaks to the land. He speaks to the earth. Why? Because land is their habitat, their environment. You take the animal and you put it into the water, what's going on to that animal? They will die. So whatever God wants to create, He speaks to a source. Because that's the environment that God set up for uh, that creature to live, to alive, to be alive. And note that this very important. If you catch this, it will totally change your life. When God wants to create man, what or who he speak to? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 to 28, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the bird of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. He said, let us make man. So who God speak to when he wants to create man? He speaks to himself. That's our source. That's our environment. That's why when you are out of relationship with God, you will die. Just like you take the fish out of the water, it will die. If you take the animal and you put it into the water, the animal dies because it's supposed to live in land. If you pluck the tree, you pluck the plant out of the soil, it's we're going to die. When you take your life and move it and, and cut off your relationship with your Creator, with, uh, with God, you die spiritually. That's why it's very important for us to have a vital relationship with our Creator, with God. That's why other religions cannot Save us because nobody, nothing can bring us back to God just like we have learned in Father Day. When we, when we disconnected with God, we're in trouble. Only Jesus is the, the only the way, the true and the life, the only way that can bring us back to God to reconnect it with our Creator, to push us back into our environment so we can live life to the fullness. The picture with me, another thing. The fish on the beach. Is he happy? He may flapping on the beach. Will he be happy? What if you, you give the fish on the beach a pile of cash? Is the fish happy? How about give the fish a beach chair and a, a pair of shade sunglasses? Would the fish be happy? Or give the fish a cocktail, a margarita, a piña colada? Would the fish happy? He flopping. It's not. How about give the fish some playboy or play fish? Will the fish happy? No. It's flapping and trying to fight for its life because it's not in its environment. Fish will never be happy on the beach. was not desire for the beach. The desire to live in the ocean, in the water. And the same thing, we weren't created for this earth. To function in existence without God. We created to function and exist in God. 
So holy life, set apart life for God. So the word saint, S A I N T, it means to set aside to live for God, to set aside to be used for God. And we as a church, we have been called out to live for God. And that's the best way to live because that is what God designed for us. He created us. In Him, in His image, in His kindness, so we can really live and enjoy our life. Just like fish have the freedom in the river, in the water. The same thing for us. To be apart from God, we're in trouble. My brother and sister, lower your expectation of the earth, not heaven. Push your highest expectation to heaven because that is where our happiness comes from. No new car, a boat, a boyfriend, a vacation. Thousands of Facebook likes. No amount of money, hairdo, physique, body, a pair of expensive shoes give you the joy that your heart craving. Because that hole inside of you, that vacuum inside of you, in your heart, is have a shape of God Himself. When you try to stop it with money, position, prestige, you always feel empty until you invite Him come into your heart and it fit just right. Thousands of men and women, young and old, have come and shared with me the day, the minute that they accept Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, their life totally changed. A man came to me and said, Pastor, the day after I make that decision and accept Christ to be my Lord and Savior, I wake up and I hear the birds sing more beautiful. And I look next to me, I saw my wife beautiful in her sleep. Totally changed his way of life. Totally changed his perspective. What a powerful transformation when you have God in your life important the fourth thing we can learn from this is holiness is not mutually exclusive of happiness you go together when you live a holy life not by yourself but the holy one the lord jesus christ live through you then you on your way to true happiness the fifth thing is holiness is a pathway to true happiness and joy. In Psalm 16, verse 11, powerful, powerful verse of the scripture that we can learn here. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasure forever. You see, the psalmist in this psalm, Psalm 16, tell us something that the word lie to us. They say, if you become a Christian, you will be miserable the rest of your life. But no, 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 no. The scripture tells us here, the psalmist who have lived with this relationship, it's just like his prayers is give up to God and say, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. That's why we are lovers of the presence of God here at VBC Houston. Because we know in the presence of God is fullness of joy. And in the right hand, in his, in his right hand, in your right hand, there are pleasure forever. When people ask me, are you happy, Pastor? When you're in Holy Land and they say, yeah, 
that's a dream of my life that I able to be there. Do you want anything else and say, like some Americans say, I feel like right now, if I die and I go to heaven, I'm happy. But more than that, not just only because of the Holy Land, but because of my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm happy. Happy to see people saved and life changed and transformed. Happy to see people's body have been healed. Happy to see marriage been restored. Family, I come together. That true happiness for me. That's why Jesus truly said, Go now and sin no more. Go now and change your life. Go now, leave sin for the better life. Not your feeling. Your feeling won't last long. But your true happiness in God, it will last forever. What a powerful thing that we see Jesus truly said. For some of you, you are there right now. You're the place. Just like that prodigal son. Used to be happy with his father and family. Ask for the inheritance, the portion that belonged to him, and go and squander with people in distant land. They thought that make him happy. Party life. The problem is when he ran out of money, the people who party with him also left him. So he find himself in the place that he in the pig pen. So hungry because no food to eat. And he look at he looked at the food that the pig eat and he wanted to have some of it, but the people did not let him eat even the pig food. And he come to realize, wait a minute, at this hour, at this time in my father's house, even the servant in my father's household, I have plenty to eat. And here I'm a son. And I'm starving. And I find myself in a place that is even lower than the pig. Because they think that the pig, when they eat well, they will gain a lot of weight, and when they sell, they make a lot of money. But this guy is not even equal to the pig. You see how sin slowly takes you to the place and degrades you. But relationship with God and live the life that God intended for you to be, oh, wonderful. Sin promised satisfaction but it's cause of disobedience to God. So praise God. God have a plan for us. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Notice something here. It said that God is faithful. That means He always true to His promise. He's faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Because God is faithful, I know that. He will not allow the temptation that is so big, so, so strong that I cannot bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out. So this is a good advice from the Word of God. When temptation comes to you like a flood, not focus on the temptation. Look around to find the way out that God opened for you. He always has a door for you to get out. Well, the problem is people don't want to get out. That's why 
they walk into and commit the sin and then blame God and say, oh, I'm just a weak man or I cannot handle that temptation. No, no, no. The Word of God says God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. God is faithful. So when you find yourself trapped, look for the door that God opened for you. This can be right now. Some of you deal with something that you're not very happy right now. You're at the place that you don't want to be. But for some reason, one slide at a time, one compromise at a time, you end up at the place just like that woman stand in front of maybe hundreds of people half naked because they grabbed her when they caught her in the act of adultery. Maybe she don't have much time to put on her full clothes. Stand there, humiliate. Stand there and feel very small. Stand there and about to endure I think the cruelest thing happened to us and is stoned to death. When a young girl, we, we play around in our hometown, we have this, uh, uh, this neighborhood fight with another neighborhood. And sometimes we're on the big field and we throw rock at each other. I remember one time it hit me right into my shoulder and it hurt so bad. Just one rock. Just imagine people stone her one stone at a time until she cannot bear it anymore and lost her life. She's ready to go through that. But here come the Savior. Here come a loving Father who know how to bring conviction to other people and I believe that He wants to save those men who think that they are righteous. Righteous than her. To recognize that they have sin in their life and they need God in their life too. And He write out whatever He wrote on the ground. Bring conviction because He asked for those of you who not commit sin or think about commit sin in your life. Cast the first stone. One by one, they drop their stone and they walk away. When Jesus stood up and he asked, Nobody condemns you? The woman said, No, Lord. Then Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Go and change your life. Go and make a difference in your life. It's not fear of what is bad, but longing for what is good. When we commit to God, live a life that He wants us to live. And recognize that every temptation is an invitation to depend on Christ. God is faithful. He will not, not allow you to have a temptation that beyond what you can bear. But in every situation, He always have a door for you to get out. So every temptation when it's come, and you know that it's more than you can handle at that point, lift up your eyes and say, Jesus, I need help. Oh, help me, Jesus. Lord, I need help in this place. And just like that, God will direct your eyes to the door that He opened for you, and you can get out. Don't be foolish and think, oh, I can handle this. There's nothing. 
The problem is if you linger long enough, and if the devil increases the price, none of us can stay. I use this analogy to, to tell you: just what if somebody comes to you and say, "Help me say this untruthful. Help me lie in this, and I give you a thousand dollar." You will look at them and say, "What? Me? Just a thousand dollar and become a liar? No, no way." Then he come back and give another offer. How about ten thousand dollar? Ten thousand? You mean ten thousand? But wait a minute! I'm a Christian. I'm, I would not sell myself short with、um, a ten thousand dollar. How about he come back and say, "How about hundred thousand dollar? Just one lie, hurt nobody." You see, if it keep increase to one hundred thousand dollar and then five hundred thousand dollar, slowly you see the number of people able to stand get smaller and smaller. What about us come back and increase the price a million dollar? Just one lie, okay? Lord Jesus, step out of my life just for ten seconds. Let me say this lie, and then you come back in. People will fail. We will fail. So every temptation is an invitation to depend on God, and you will get victory. Know the difference bef- between remorse and repentance. Remorse, you feel bad about it, but you knew nothing about it. Repent, repent, it means return to its highest level, or resentence in your life. You see, if you rebuke the enemy and return to God by repenting of your sin and receive Christ. Your spirit will be reborn. Your mind will be renewed. Your life will be rebuilt, and you will have a changed life. A revival will happen. Transformation will happen in your life, and you can be break free from whatever holds you down. That's what Jesus actually said. He did not say go and do whatever you like. But he said, "Go and sin no more. Go and change your life. Go and live the life that God intended for you to." Just like that fish flopping on the beach, doesn't matter whatever you give to that fish, he's not happy at all. He only happy when he go back to the water. You see, many times life suggests us, give us medication for the thing that nothing can heal, can bring relief. The offer of this life: go out there and party, you will be happy. Many times we walk into a restaurant and they say, "Happy hour." I say, "What?" When I first come to America, and they say happy hour at three o'clock, that means the drink is only fifty percent of what it truly costs us. That's just commercial. That is a lie because that is not happy hour at all. After that so-called happy hour, it will be very sad. So learn. And apply what Jesus really said. Go and sin no more. Go and live your life in sin and change. I love you. I'm about to pay for everything that is need to be paid, so you can be free. So you can live the best life ever. True happiness that God have designed for your life. Does that help anybody at all? May God help us. You will say, Pastor, how can I respond to this message? If you're at the place that you 
recognize that you're not supposed to be. You're not happy. Then look at the door that God opened for you even right now. The fact that you're here in this service is the door that God has opened for you. Maybe he saw what's going on and the Christ in your heart and say, God, I don't want to be in this place anymore. I want to be changed. And your prayer maybe a few months ago had prompted us. The pastor of VBC Houston, we sit down, we pray, and we think about the series that God has changed the message because to hear the cry of your heart. Then respond to Him. Respond to Him. Reconnected with God. If you're disconnected with Him, sin has disconnected you with God, then come back through Jesus Christ. Forgiveness, you can be reconnected with God. You can be at peace with God. So if you're here today and you want your life to be restored, to return to the stage that God wants for us to live, then respond to this message. Father Sam and I in the leadership we will stand and pray with you and help you. We go through the same thing when we accept Christ to be our Lord and Savior. And many times that we fail, we stumble, we come back to God because God is faithful. And He always gives us the door so we can escape. And when you took that door, God will restore you. And if you're here and you Really, your life is far away from God. You need to return to Him. You need to accept Him to be your Lord and Savior. He is the only way to bring you back to that connection, that environment that God has created you. Like fish live in the water, tree and plant live in the, the shore. The animal live in the land. We only true living when we in God, the true environment that we belong to. If that is you, I want to help you too. I want to lead you and help you pray and invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. Then you will be on your way to true happiness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. For that day, Lord, the way that you forgive and the way that you have taught that woman how to be free, how to get rid of sin and guilt. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for inspiring. Inspire John to write down this story for us. What amazing love. We thank you. We ask right now, Lord, that your truth will be applied. So in this place and everywhere in the world that people listen to this message, they will begin to experience true happiness in their life. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as you respond to the message and allow us to pray with you, church, we dismiss you and say have a wonderful July 4 Independent Day. Enjoy the freedom outside and inside because what God brings into your life, the true freedom, true happiness when you're connected with Him. God bless you and I will see you later. The altar is open. Anyone who needs pray and respond to the message today, we're waiting for you and minister to you. Amen. God bless.